Hola, I'm Santiu. Can you hear me? Yes? Okay, very good. It feels so nice. Las sensaciones son tan buenas, es tan fantástico de ver este auditorio eh, después de un año y medio de una situación muy difícil para los profesores y para los estudiantes. Very difficult situation, muy complicado para todos. Ok, so, first of all, thank you, gracias, and welcome, uh, bienvenidos para estar aquí. Ok, so, uh, um, we're in Barcelona, uh, Catalonia. So, um, um, we're going to uh, start practicing some multilingualism here, okay? Uh, you're all going to be a linguists of some sort. And um, so, uh, I'll be using Catalan, which is the um, uh, language of the, of the uh, country. Uh, also, Spanish, um, because it's the official language uh, in Spain and co-official in Catalonia. And I'm using English because I know that uh, many of you have chosen us uh, because of this uh, international outlook uh, uh, that uh, Pompeu Fabra is very proud of. Okay, So I'm going to be combining, and uh, I think this is going to be... Um, you know, the, the, the normal state of things while you're here. So uh, this, I think, would be one of the first uh, uh, recommendations, like soak in this, uh, uh, you know, this uh, language management practices and, and you know, just be mm, uh, flexible and, and, and enjoy that. I, I think that uh, that's one of the, the great opportunities in, in Barcelona. Okay, um, just one, one more warning. Ya empezaré el catalá y en, en al, hablaré uh, español después, pero... One COVID thing. Um, so everybody's uh, supposed to wear uh, face covering, face mask. Todo el mundo tiene que llevar uh, mascarilla en clase. Okay, uh, en realidad en el campus, ¿vale? Pero hoy, en este acto, Las personas que toman la palabra, people who are uh, taking the floor, like myself, uh, like Dr. Pilar Prieto, and like our guest speaker, uh, Professor uh, Maria Josep Cuenca, uh, when we're speaking, we're going to remove the face covering. But as soon as we're not speaking, then we will resume wearing the face mask, okay? Uh, this uh, auditorium has uh, uh, ventilation, good uh, ventilation, so uh, the campus is very safe. Our premises are really uh, safe. Uh, so you need not uh, be concerned uh, if I'm not wearing a mask or if uh, Dr. Prieto is not wearing a mask or, or if our speaker is wearing a mask. Our teachers uh, are going to be wearing masks as long as the uh, medical authorities uh, advise us to. Okay, so um, that's going to be the case for, um, we don't know, you know, how long. Uh, if things improve, we might see some uh, improvements there also, but uh, at this point, I cannot, I cannot guarantee. By the way, I did not introduce myself. I'm uh, Anna Spunia. Uh, currently, I'm the head of the Department of Translation and Language Sciences. Um, and so, um, on behalf of the program uh, coordinators, uh, in fact, we have four master's programs here. Uh, so on behalf of, of, this, uh, of our uh, coordinators, um, we thank you for having chosen this department. So what I'll do now is I'll, I'll go back to Catalan, uh, then I'll speak in Spanish, and then I'll go back to English. Yes? Okay. Doncs ara uh, començo, començo en català. Uh, avui don, donem inici al curs acadèmic dels màsters oficials del Departament. Uh, són quatre màsters, uh, màster en estudis de traducció, màster en estudis del discurs, màster en lingüística teòrica i aplicada i màster en traducció entre llengües globals, xinès, uh, castellà. En nom dels coordinadors us agraïm que ens hagueu escollit um, la missió d'aquest departament és fer recerca de primera línia i de traslladar aquest coneixement cap a una formació de postgrau que us permeti avançar cap a una carrera professional, 
sigui en el món acadèmic, en l'ensenyament, en la comunicació, en la traducció. Com he dit en anglès, ens heu escollit també per la vocació internacional de la universitat. Jo crec que trobareu, jo crec no, estic segura, soc la directora del departament, per tant ho conec bé, trobareu professors compromesos, professors molt ben preparats i trobareu també un personal d'administració i serveis realment al vostre servei. Jo espero que podreu trobar aquí una comunitat d'aprenentatge i que ens enriquireu amb la vostra presència. Us desitjo només molt bona sort amb els vostres estudis. Ok, ara em passo a l'espanyol. Hoy damos inicio al curso académico de los másteres oficiales del departamento. En nombre de los coordinadores de los cuatro másteres, son Pilar Prieto del Máster en Lingüística Teórica y Aplicada, el profesor José Francisco Ruiz Casanova del Máster en Estudios de Traducción, la doctora Gemma Andújar del Máster en Traducción entre Lenguas Globales y la doctora Encarnación Atienza del Máster en Estudios del Discurso. En su nombre, pues, os doy la bienvenida. Os agradezco que nos hayáis elegido. Como decía en catalán, la misión de este departamento es realizar buena investigación en, en, las, en los ámbitos uh, de la traducción y de las ciencias del lenguaje en un sentido amplio y por eso nos enorgullece eh, pues poder ofrecer cuatro programas de máster distintos porque tenemos uh, profesores comprometidos, eh, muy bien preparados y tenemos uh, bueno, instalaciones, tenemos infraestructura y ilusión. Y tenemos también un personal de administración y servicios que está realmente a nuestro servicio y a vuestro servicio. Yo espero que podréis encontrar aquí vuestra comunidad de aprendizaje, que eh, construiréis una buena, eh, un buen ambiente de, de aprendizaje y que nos enriqueceréis con vuestra presencia. ¿eh? Estáis en Barcelona, estáis en Cataluña, estáis eh, en un entorno donde conviven eh, lenguas y culturas muy diversas. En, en Barcelona yo creo que se hablan más de... Yo quiero que, creo que el último censo, Joan, se en... 300, 300 lenguas diferentes. ¿eh? Por lo tanto... Eh, os invitamos a, no solo a, a conocernos, a conocer la, nuestra lengua y nuestra cultura, pero también os invitamos a hacernos participar de la vuestra. Muy bien, pues os deseo buena suerte en, en estos estudios. And finally, a few words uh, in English. Um, as I said, our mission is to, to do first-rate uh, research. Uh, that's our, our mission and our ambition too. And to transfer that knowledge to graduate um, education that prepares students for a successful and at least a gratifying career. As a, people always use successful careers, I think uh, after what we've been living in the past two years, uh, it should also be gratifying. Whether in, in academia or in industry, in teaching, in communication, Um, we know that you have chosen us for our international outlook. Um, you will find committed faculty, you will find committed administrative personnel. I hope sincerely that you feel at home here and find and build your learning community. I wish you very enriching experience. Um, and as I said, you're in Barcelona, you're in Catalonia. I encourage you to get to know us, uh, to get to learn a little bit of our language, uh, to participate in our culture. Um, complex as it is. Uh, and also to enrich us with your own background and your own experiences. And um, good luck in your studies. 
Um, so um, now I will uh, give the floor uh, to Dr. Pilar Prieto, uh, who is the coordinator of the Masters in Theoretical and Practical Linguistics, but I think she's speaking on behalf of uh, every uh, coordinator. Um, okay, uh, Pilar, I don't know which language you're going to use, but uh, I think we've covered yes, uh, all bases here, right? <laughs> okay. Yes, thanks a lot, Anna, for this nice introduction. Uh, jo parlaré en, en anglès uh, perquè he pensat també que la majoria, alguns de vosaltres heu vingut i encara no, no sabeu prou català o castellà, llavors començarem en anglès. Val. Uh, well, I'm very glad that uh, Maria Josep has accepted our invitation to uh, basically present uh, a talk for our welcome session of the four MA programs in the department. And I'm really honored to sketch uh, her biographical data for you. Uh, personally, I've met uh, Maria Josep in meetings and conferences over the years. And uh, I know her uh, also from my participation in the Catalan Grammar Project that she has been leading. And I can say that she's a, a real pleasure uh, to work with. Uh, it was a, a very nice experience. Uh, Maria Josep Cuenca uh, is a professor of Catalan linguistics at the Universitat de València and member of the Catalan Language Academy, uh, Institut d'Estudis Catalans. Her research focuses on text grammar and discourse analysis, especially the Ixis uh, compound sentences, connectives, discourse markers and interjections, among other subjects related to the interface between syntax and discourse. She works within the general framework of cognitive linguistics. She's published more than 100 uh, articles on research issues that are related to Catalan syntax and discourse analysis, and more than a dozen books that have helped generations of students to understand a variety of topics in linguistics. She's been, visiting, she's been a visiting scholar in different universities, such as Universitat degli Studi de Venezia, uh, University of California at Berkeley, Stanford University, and University of Cambridge. Importantly, not only she has worked uh, intensively for a Catalan language from a scientific point of view, from a linguistic point of view, but she has also contributed strongly to dissemination and prescriptive uh, projects. Professor Cuenca has been the director of the project Gramatica Essencial de la Llengua Catalana, at the Institute of Studies Catalans, which resulted in the publication of two grammars, which are uh, uh, really uh, the pillar of uh, the, our grammatical uh, system right now. And this is a Gramatica Essencial de la Llengua Catalana, del 2018, and Gramatica Básica use, use de la Llengua Catalana, del 2019. In relation to her work in translation, she is a member of the spin-off te Technolinguistica, where she's in charge of the coordination of the sub-area of translation. Finally, I wanted to stress that in 2020, she received the uh, uh, Creu de Sant Jordi uh, for, uh, this is a, given, uh, is a great prize uh, given by our, by our Catalan government, and this is, was for her great contribution to the knowledge and dissemination of the grammar of Catalan. And, uh, well, I would like to thank you on the name of, uh, you know, our faculty for all your work and uh, we really look forward to know more about these course markers and uh, the relationship with translation. Thanks a lot, uh, Maria Josep. Yes. Okay, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Bon dia. Uh, and well, I want to thank you, thank the university and the head of the department and the coordinators of the masters for inviting me. This is my first post-COVID <laughs> uh, lecture, so it's kind of emotional <laughs> uh, <laughs> in a sense because well, it's been a long time. So well, let's, let's see how it works. So today uh, I am going to talk about discourse markers and translation because I was asked uh, for a topic related to several things, linguistics, discourse analysis and translation, and I thought that this could be a good like meeting point 
uh, among these uh, different areas. And well, I will talk about, I will start talking about the, the essential, some basic concepts. I cannot go through the concepts because there are hundreds and hundreds of contributions to, to the topic of discourse markers, as you may know, and lots of different classifications, uh, definitions, and so on and so forth. But uh, my point is just giving you the, a glimpse of the main concepts so that you have these concepts uh, from my point of view, my proposal after many years working on the topic and as a base uh, for a case study. I will show you a case study uh, analyzing the translation of discourse markers uh, in Catalan academic um, writing into English and this, uh, this is, I hope this is interesting not only or not especially from a descriptive point of view about Catalan and English, but uh, to make us think about uh, discourse markers, how they work, and also what is the process that translators uh, use when we translate discourse markers, which of course is not a conscious process. It's something that we do like normally, like it's spontaneous, but uh, I think that this case study, even if it's restricted, of course it, it has to be restricted to a certain parameters, uh, I think it's interesting to make us think about our ideas about discourse marking, about translating discourse markers, and also about some of the previous contributions to, to the topic. Okay, so I will start with a very general definition, which is basic even though it's very general, too ge maybe too general, but it's a starting point. What is a discourse marker? Uh, Schifrin in 1987 uh, defined discourse markers as sequentially dependent units that bracket units of talk. And more specifically, she said, I define markers at a more theoretical level as member of a functional class of verbal and nonverbal devices which provide contextual coordinates for ongoing talk. So the, here the idea that I think that is the most important idea is that discourse markers define a functional class, not a categorical class. And, and this is part of the problem and also part of the, the way we think about discourse markers. Uh, Redeker defines discourse, she talks about discourse operators, you know that there are many different labels to refer to these items. It's a word or phrase, for instance, a conjunction, adverbial, comment, clause, interjection that is uttered with a primary function of bringing to the listener's attention a partial kind of linkage of the upcoming utterance with the immediate discourse context. So we have a functional class, so we will find different categories that can perform this function, which is a function of linkage, link between portions of discourse, which means that they bracket, that they somehow separate, somehow they separate, both separate and link. So establish a, a, a boundary and also indicate how the what's coming has to be interpreted uh, in reference to what, what's previous. And this is still very general, as you will see, so we, we have to go deeper into that and, and be more specific, but it's a starting point. So we have this general function, and uh, my point is that we need to define which classes, which word classes can perform this function, and this general function, uh, how, how it can be uh, specified in this course. Uh, but first, uh, there's a, a, a very important difference, which is not generally pointed out, but for me, in my studies, it's basic uh, in the description of discourse markers and, and how they work. And as you will see, it's important for the case study that I will present, is the fact that discourse markers can have two different scopes. They can be used at sentence level, connecting parts 
of a, of a sentence as an independent unit, as in the first example, or at text level. So we have in the first example, Justin Bieber is the king of Instagram and therefore the king of pop music. So we here have and therefore linking and this is at sentence level. So the whole unit is a sentence and we have two elements that are linked. And at text level, uh, Bieber also sold more than such and such copies of the album, the four notes, etc., which was top 20, but nowhere Bieber is more popular than on Instagram. So we here have but, which is linking at text level, is linking the next paragraph with the previous paragraph. So this, this is important because even, even if we have linkage at, in, at, uh, at both levels, the conditions uh, of, the, of discourse marking in one level or in the other level are different. And many people would consider only text level as discourse marking. I cannot enter into all these different perspectives, but just we keep in mind that we have these elements and therefore but, which are uh, discourse markers, therefore is clearly considered as a discourse marker, and and but are usually considered discourse markers, but not everyone would consider them because they are conjunctions. We will talk about a little bit uh, that. Uh, and some people do not consider sentence level as discourse marking, but as compound. But for sure, the case in the second example would be considered by everyone as, as discourse marking. And now the functions. This general function of linkage, uh, my, my proposal, which is, uh, is also uh, similar to other proposals uh, such as Redeker's, uh, similar, not the same uh, classification and other people like Degan or Quibble. So uh, academics, uh, generally uh, identified three or four, it depends on the classification, domains, general domains, uh, in which a discourse marker can act. So we have the ideational domain or propositional, uh, in which uh, the, uh, the discourse marker indicate a propositional meaning such as addition, disjunction, contrast, concession. So these are the general meanings that we uh, identify with compound sentences, but they can they can also uh, be identified at text level, not only in compound sentences. We now have this another domain, which is textual domain or sequential or structural, which is the result of the marker bracket in a unit of talk, such as the text, the sequence, or a turn. A uh, clear instance of, uh, of the textual domain is uh, the use of a discourse marker to introduce a turn or a response. And then we also have the interpersonal domain in which we have discourse markers which link, but they also add some uh, interpersonal subjective or intersubjective uh, meaning to, to what's coming next. So they linked as the ones in textual domain, but they also indicate attitude, knowledge, or a stance of the speaker with respect uh, to what is being said or to the hearer. So we see s some examples. So here I am just sketching the general ideas that we will need to follow the case study. Okay? So at the, at the idea, ideational domain, for instance, this example, the government had sought time on the grounds that it is in the process of establishing appropriate medical and physical fitness standards and building required infrastructure, which includes, etc. The bench, however, rejected the government stance. So we have here that, however, is linking the previous paragraph and the next paragraph, and the meaning is contrast. It's indicating contrast between the two ideas here. Uh, at the textual domain, for instance, why does she think she was unhappy? One of the reasons was I couldn't wrap my head around the fact that people didn't seem to care about anything, that everyone just cared about themselves, rather than everything that was happening with the world. And being an oversensitive child with autism, it was definitely something I thought about a lot, and it made me sad. This and is not 
like I want a cake and an ice cream. It, it's, it's beyond propositional linkage. It, it, it indicates continuation in discourse. So this can instantiate the textual uh, domain use of a discourse marker. So we have a group of sentences link uh, by end as a discourse marker with the next sentence and the meaning is continuity. Finally, interpersonal domains, uh, for instance, so there's hope your, for your friendship. This is from an interview to, to Greta Thunberg. Uh, so there's hope for your friendship with Donald Trump. She lets out the hiccup of laughter. Well, I don't think we will enjoy each other's company that much. We have very different interests. So this well, uh, it's bracketing a unit of talk. It's introducing a response and indicates disagreement, like, like uh, mitigated disagreement. Hmm? So it's linking, as Anne would do, for instance, but it also indicates the stance of the speaker, and that's why uh, I would locate this at the interpersonal domain, because it's not only linking, but also expressing uh, the attitude of the speaker. As for categories, my proposal, this is my proposal that I, I have elaborated uh, during many years, and I, I propose to consider three categories. So we remember that discourse marker is a functional class, so which elements can act as a discourse marker? Thus my proposal is considering three elements. So we have conjunctions, I don't know if I can, there's a pointer here. Oops, oh, no, it was wrong. I don't know how to go back to, sorry, I was trying to use a pointer, but mm, mm, wrong, wrong place. Okay, I, I, I go on, I go on for a while. So we have three, three categories. Si es que toca ataque este encuentro, que debía ser el punter. Ah, okay, oh. <laughs> it was easy, <laughs> thank you. Okay, three categories. So we have conjunctions like but or and, we have seen that in the previous examples. And we have these other elements like however, parenthetical connectives, however, uh, that is, uh, therefore, hmm? these elements are the ones that are clearly considered as discourse markers and also pragmatic connectives like well, we've seen the uses of these elements in the previous examples and we will see some more afterwards. Uh, and we have these three categories, that's my proposal, considering that there are three categories of elements uh, which can act as a discourse as a discourse marker. So as I said, conjunctions typically introduce compound sentences. Only some of them, basically and and but, can introduce uh, elements at the text level. So many people would consider that only when they introduce a text level they are discourse markers, so it depends on your definition of discourse marking. Parenthetical connectives are appositional and syntactically detached items that can combine with conjunctions. We can say, and furthermore, or we can say, but however, uh, and they are typically text connectives, uh, even though they can also be used at sentence level. So it's not that ones are only at text level and others are only at sentence level. That makes the thing difficult, but that's, that's reality. <laughs> So we, we just we describe what's going on. And pragmatic connectives are appositional and syntactically detached items, just as parenthetical connectives, but they add this modal meaning, so they are used at the interpersonal uh, level, uh, mainly bracketing units of, of talk, such as interventions, terms, or, or units inside the terms. So this is the, the general proposal we have here some more, the, the, the previous examples uh, in brief, so conjunctions would be this and that we've seen before, parenthetical connective, however, in the previous example, and pragmatic connective, well. So this is the, this is the general idea, these are the, the, the map of my proposal, just to understand then what we, we will analyze next. So now, now we are set, now we have 
the count says, maybe you say, oh, I don't agree with you, okay, but it's me talking, you know? So <laughs> uh, let's pretend for a while that you agree with me. <laughs> or you say, okay, let's see where you go with your classification. You see, it's nice because it's three and three, so it's kind of nice. Three is a nice number for classifications. I, I, I really like it. Uh, okay, so now we have a general idea of what a discourse marker C is and some examples. I think that examples are more telling than definitions, especially because definitions are very broad. Hmm? And then we have these three levels of uh, these three functions or domains. So we have the uh, ideational, uh, sequential or textual and interpersonal and three categories conjunctions, parenthetical connectives, and pragmatic connectives. Okay, so now we start our case study. Uh, the translating a discourse marker is a twofold task. So when someone, when a, a, translation is, a translator is translating a discourse marker, first we have a comprehension uh, process in which we interpret the discourse marker and we interpret its meaning and interpreting the discourse, the meaning of a discourse marker is not as straightforward as interpreting the meaning of a lexical element. When you read table, you know what a table is, okay? And it's relatively easy, well, it's not that easy, I am simplifying here, but uh, is you say, okay, table in Catalan, uh, uh, taula in Spanish, mesa, etc., etc. So it's relatively easy. Uh, in many cases, you have a one-to-one, -one, not, not always, of course, but in many cases, you have a one-to-one -one correspondence. But this is not always the case with discourse markers because many discourse markers, um, discourse markers do not have a content-like meaning, but a proced procedural meaning. And it depends on the context heavily much more than lexical items. So there's a different kind of processing. So we have to interpret the discourse marker in relationship with the two elements that the discourse marker is connecting, and not only the meaning, but the intent, intended effects of the discourse marker. And then we have this production, which is a transfer of this relational meaning, and we have to transfer the denotation and connotation of a discourse marker. You would say, okay, this is the same when you translate, or you always understand and produce. Yes, but the thing is that it's not so straightforward as it would be with other elements with uh, lexical content in many cases, which is uh, translating lexical items sometimes is, is also difficult, of course, and you have to think. Uh, but uh, when we translate a discourse marker, we are not translating the discourse marker. We are translating a chunk of discourse and try to find something that goes well. And sometimes what goes well is nothing. And this is important. And that's the part of what, what I will explain later, that my point is focusing on implicitation and explicitation of discourse markers. When we delete or we add a discourse marker, why is it so? Is it possible? Is it good? Is it bad? That, that's the, my, my final uh, end, so to speak. So the factors for translating the discourse markers are functional equivalence, frequency and conditions of use, such as scope, position, concurrence, and collocation, and meaning, domain, and also polyfunctionality and ambiguity. Because part of the problem with the translation of discourse markers is that some of them are polyfunctional, they have different uh, functions and they can be ambiguous. So you, the translator disambiguates. Sometimes in a good way, maybe not, it depends. So I have studied the strategies to translate intersentential connectives, connective discourse markers. So discourse markers linking at sentence level. You remember the second example, this but introducing a paragraph. So I have restricted the analysis to uh, inter intersentential level. And I have analyzed a parallel one direction corpus of academic papers on history 
two volumes of the, of the journal Catalan Historical Review. Uh, this journal includes uh, papers in Catalan translated into English. And I have analyzed, manually analyzed, it, it's been it's a, a time-consuming task, but it's an, an interesting task. Uh, Ten papers in Catalan translated into English, about 100,000 uh, words. I have identified five, more than 500 discourse markers in almost 3,000 sentences. So uh, about 18% of sentences have an intersentential discourse marker. And what, which are the research questions? Uh, first, uh, which are the strategies uh, for translating discourse markers at intersentential level? Uh, one important thing is that at intersentential level, discourse markers are not needed from a grammatical or a structural point of view. So this is also important that they, they could be from a traditional grammatical point of view, they could be excluded all the time, but it's not. Of course, they are, they are important for the cohesion of the text. But mm, in this case, we don't have the restrictions of a syntax demanding, so to speak, a, di a discourse marker. Uh, and then the second research question is, which are the syntactic factors for implicitating and explicitating? I will define what, what I mean by implicitation and explicitation, and which are the, the semantic, pragmatic factors uh, which account for implicitation or explicitation. So for, uh, for the purposes of, of this paper, I have uh, differentiated four general techniques, literal or almost literal translation, dynamic translation with another discourse marker with a different, completely different meaning, or with an element which is not a discourse marker, uh, omission of a discourse marker and addition. And I have also differentiated uh, generalization as an specification of meaning, as we will see. Uh, I will I will describe these concepts. And implicitation can be is the result either of omission of a discourse marker or generalization, the use of a discourse marker. Uh, whose meaning is more general than the one in the in the in the language in the original in the source language and explicitation is the result either of the addition of a discourse marker which was an existent in the in the source text or the specification the use of a discourse marker whose meaning is more uh, concrete more specific than than the previous one Okay, here we have some examples. Uh, you have the examples in Catalan and then the translation into English. I will go very fast, just focusing on the main ideas. So we can see literal translation in the first example. We have E, which is and in Catalan, and the translation is and. So this is literal, literal translation. I have also considered literal translation some cases in which there are slight changes, for instance, position change because this does not really affect the meaning or the conditions of use of the discourse markers. So that would be literal. We have dynamic, well, the, all the rest strictly are dynamic translation because it's non-literal, but I have differentiated those cases in which there's a change, a huge change in meaning. For instance, in the example, en cambi, meaning in contrast, is translated as likewise. And likewise, and and can be, do not have the same meaning. In this case, the translator is very good and has repaired the original because there was no contrast between the ideas. So the translator, you know that translators are the best readers and the best interpreters, if they are good translators, of course. And, and then find, we find all, all the errors of the others. We don't find our own errors, <laughs> but we are very, very good at finding the errors of the, of the authors. And this is a case where an error was corrected. But it's not always the source of this technique is not always error. Sometimes it's a different interpretation that is possible or other factors, as I would say. Then we have omission. For instance, in, in the next example, we have uh, dongs, which is therefore, 
and the translate in the translation it disappears. And there's also addition. So in the next example, there was no discourse marker, and in the English translation, the translator added indeed. So the first thing that we see is that literal translation in this kind of text uh, and in this corpus is overwhelmingly frequent. And this is something that say, uh, okay, but many, many, many authors would say that is not so frequent. So this is a fair result to consider. Not to say that this is general, it's always happening, but uh, it's, it's frequent, at least when we are dealing with written text, academic text, history, so where, when we don't have um, discourse markers acting at the interpersonal domain. So the first thing is that depending on the type of text, maybe the language is uh, combined, and also the, the, the kind of interaction uh, in the text, that we, we can have different results. So this is important to, to, to keep in mind. But, and we see that even though literal translation or almost literal translation is very frequent, then omission and addition, and also, as we will see, generalization or specification, which here they are not differentiated, I will make the difference afterwards, uh, are relatively frequent. And, and even if they are not so, so frequent, they are puzzling. You wonder, but why? How? Why someone would omit a discourse marker or would add a discourse marker? So this is what uh, intrigues me and, and this is the idea. Okay, so we talk about implicitation of, of meaning when we add, when, when we delete or reduce the meaning of an item in translation. Uh, Claudi and Claudia and Caroli uh, talk about implicitation as derived from omission, contraction, or generalization. So this is the general definition by Binea Gavernet, which is a classic uh, manual of, of translation, as you, as you may know. Then uh, translation can, uh, implicitation can be achieved by total omission. For instance, in one, I, she is deleted in the, in the translation. This it would correspond to so and forth and is deleted. Existeixen diversos exemples per explicar aquesta actitud pragmàtica i adaptativa envers la nova realitat política. Així, la vida parroquial, en ser l'església, un dels pilars, eh, is like, for example, and is deleted. We can have partial omission, which is frequent, not always the case, but frequent, when we have two discourse markers. For instance, this is relatively general, when we have a conjunction and then a parenthetical connective. Pero no just means the translation is nonetheless, just the second part has been translated, the second discourse marker. And also generalization. For instance, in línies generals, aquesta tesi ha romàs bastant intacta i còmodament abraçada per la, historiogra la historiografia catalana. No obstant això, no té en compte ni la singularitat. No obstant això, is like despite this, nonetheless, notwithstanding, is more specific than However, however, is like the general contrastive uh, discourse marker, parenthetical connective in English. So, uh, previous contributions. There are many contributions talking about omission of discourse markers uh, as a frequent uh, strategy in translation. Uh, here you have, I will go through this, yes, we ha you have some of the literature about, about these elements and mm, omission uh, has generally been considered taking into account like, um, elements like well, which is uh, a pragmatic connective and very generally meaning and polyfunctional. So in this case, uh, omission is very frequent. And alors, in French, French Italian, uh, also a polyfunctional ambiguous marker. So this phenomenon of omission has been studied in the case of very general markers or polysemous, polysemous ambiguous markers. Uh, and, and the results are that omission is relatively frequent. It can be very frequent or less frequent depending on the gender 
and, and, the, and the discourse marker uh, analyzed. But in my case, I have analyzed all the markers, not just one marker, and this, this makes a difference. It's very completely different if you just if you select a marker and you select this marker because you know that this marker has this particular thing. I did it myself in 2008 with well. Uh, but I think that th this perspective of not analyzing just one marker or a group of markers, but just analyzing the whole, the whole uh, picture is interesting and you sometimes get surprising responses or things that the literature does not tell. Here we have more papers and my, my research is similar to Beha uh, and he analyzed a business text translated uh, from English into German and, and the other way around and, and his results are similar to are similar to mine, or my results are similar to his, because he, he, made, he did it like 10 years ago. Okay, so factors to implicitate. Uh, my analysis, or the analysis uh, of in the bibliography, uh, they say that the factors to implicitate are the absence of a functional equivalent. When you don't have a functional equivalent, then the translator may just omit the discourse marker under specification and polyfunctionality, as I said before. The type of coherent relations, like continuous relations, there are relations that are more easy to express implicitly than other relations, syntactic differences uh, in the languages or in the text, and, uh, and avoiding stylistic, stylistic awareness. And there are also factors not to implicitate because translators are risk averse, because there is often uh, no good reason to do so, and because taking things away tends to be more difficult than keep them. And this is, I, I like this because it's, it's, yeah, it's, when you translate you know this, that, uh, well, there's a word, I keep a word. But it's not always like that, not with discus markers, I have to say. Okay, uh, so we see uh, this meaning, so my analysis, departing from the literature, I made the analysis of my data, the, the analysis of my data, and these are the factors that I identified in my corpus to omit a discourse marker. First, the meaning. Mar markers with a sequential meaning can be deleted more frequently than other markers. So we have this I, show, I see, so we've seen another case before, and it's the same. I see is like is continuation and it has been deleted. So this is one factor. Co-occurrence, when we have more than one discourse marker uh, together, but also in, a, in, in near, then it is possible that one of them is omitted. For instance, in five, Obes poden fer càlculs de proporcions de baixes enfonsats amb productes d'aquest origen ara bé, els estudis en aquest sentit solament permeten arribar a indicar les tendències. Amb tot, queda clar, so it's like, however, nonetheless, and the translator felt that that was too much contrast and deleted one of them. In Catalan it's fine. You, you, you read it and it's fine, but when you are translating it's like, mm. and in English it's like, mm, too many things going on. <laughs> then uh, syntactic changes, uh, when the meaning of the discourse marker integrates in another word, and referring, per example, we refer, for example, uh, is translated as they include, and then include, includes, refer, and for example. So this is also a reason to, to delete, to omit the, the discourse mark. The change from intersentential to intrasentential connection, so when you have two separate uh, sentences and then the translation merges them into a compound sentences and compound sentence as this, then the change would lead to the omission of the discourse mark. Uh, for partial omission, we have co-occurrence of discourse markers. As I said before, we have two discourse markers, a conjunction and a parenthetical connective, and generally the conjunction disappears. So we have it and mateis and yet, and the translation only, only keeps yet. Even and yet would do. 
it's not a problem of grammaticality or, or incorrectness. Okay, then we have generalization of meaning. So implicitation by generalization uh, implies that the discourse marker is translated by a more polyfunctional, less specified discourse marker. And here we've seen 30 cases of generalization, which is relatively a lot, almost as omission, which was 37 cases. So all these markers in Catalan, Arabe, Per Contra, No Stanta, Isha, etc., etc., have been some, uh, in, a, in, in some cases translated by however. En efecte is translated by indeed, d'altra banda, by and, coma contra pun, yet. So we have this effect of generalization of, of meaning. It depends on the frequency of the markers. So one marker can be very frequent in one language and not so frequent. The, the direct counterpart can not be so frequent in the, in the target language. We have ben al contrari, translated to however. Uh, the change from intersentential to intersentential connection, d'altra banda, translated into and, and now it's a compound sentence, not two separate sentences. So this will be the factors to implicitate. Okay, so now we have the, the picture of which are the factors to omit or generalize a discourse marker. Now we go to the opposite phenomenon, which is explicitation. So in the source language, there is no discourse marker, and then the translator adds a discourse marker. Or there's a general discourse marker, and the translator uses a more specific discourse marker. OK, so this is the process of introducing information, which can be derived from the context or, uh, of situation. So we have here, for instance, the addition of a discourse marker. In Catalan, we have no discourse marker. And in English, the translator added indeed. And there's no grammatical need to add indeed. So it's just that the translator felt the need or the convenience of adding this discourse marker. Specification, this case, E and is translated as furthermore. So you can see, I now read in English, they exploited the space over which they held jurisdiction, essentially through crop and livestock farming, although they, have, they also harvested resources from forests, rivers, and the coast, and eventually met, met, metals and stones as well. Furthermore, it is worth noting that they were small cities. It could have said, and it is worth, or simply nothing. But it's like, and, 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 another and, and the translator said, furthermore change. Hmm? But it is not something that is needed from, on any account. Okay, so the explicitation, um, the, the phenomenon of explicitation has been studied uh, linked to what is called the explicitation hypothesis uh, uh, formulated by Blum Kalka, and he says that translated text tends to be more explicit as for cohesive mechanisms than the source text, regardless the differences between the linguistic and discourse systems of the two languages involved. This hypothesis uh, has been challenged by many, many people, many scholars, and for instance, Claudia and Caroli have proposed the asymmetry hypothesis, which considers, because this splitization hypothesis is considered as a universal, so it says that whenever we translate, we add things and we do not remove things. And we have seen that th this, is not, this is not exactly what happens. Eh? So uh, other scholars have proved that this is, not, this is too general, it's an overgeneralization, and they propose the asymmetry hypothesis, which is that explicitation in the, direc in the direction L1, L2 are not always counterbalanced by implicitations in the opposite directions because translators prefer to use operation involving explicitation and often fail to, per to perform optional implicitation. You see that this is more fine grain, it's not so general and it looks better uh, as for our experience as translator or, or analysts. So the, con the, the conclusion of this is that the addition of discourse markers in L2 is expected to be more frequent than the omission of discourse markers in L1 when comparing a two-way 
corpus. Okay, I will go through this. There are several contributions to this topic. And uh, also there are uh, factors to explicitate the markers. Some markers tend to be explicitated more frequently than others. Type of coherence relation. Subjective relations tend to be more often explicitated than uh, objective relationships. Relationships, yeah. Uh, there, are, there can be syntactic differences between the two languages involved. Uh, sometimes uh, we try to avoid stylistic mark options and uh, explicitness uh, can minimize the risk of misunderstanding. So this will be the general cases. So now we go to our corpus. We have 34 cases of addition. And the factors that I have identified as significant are the meaning, markers indicating continuity, but also contrast tend to be added. Uh, Co-occurrence, reinforcement of another particle or word can explain the addition of a discourse marker and scope, change from intrasentential to intersentential connection. So the other way around, as in the case of implicitation. The general aim seems to be improving the naturalness in the translated text by explicitating a coherence relation. So we see cases, some examples of meaning, continuity, contrast. So we see an addition of an, an addition of however. Reinforcement, for instance, in this case, eh, malgrad la aparenza, no es una, una, una autobiografía, the translation yet, despite appearances, it is not an autobiography, so yet is added to reinforce despite. <coughs> and scope, we have a compound sentence, uh, a complex sentence, and it has been segmented into two different sentences, and in this case, in fact, has been added. As for specification, we have 15 cases. We have here some the, the cases of specification, for instance, E and has been turned into furthermore, indeed, likewise. Some examples change from intra to intersentential. So we have E and turned into furthermore. And, uh, and then we have also the cases of specification. For instance, Ben Mirat, all things considered, has been translated as a clause if we examine the social situation carefully. Maybe because Ben Mirat is difficult to translate literally uh, into English, so the translator has interpreted the meaning and translated in a more uh, explicit way in this case. Okay, so now we go to, uh, I have shown you examples, the factors, and now we wrap up everything and summarize the factors to implicitate and explicitate and come to the conclusions. So for omission, the critical factors for omitting discourse markers acting at the intersentential level in my corpus, yeah, so it's not general, but that is the analysis of this corpus, are the following. Collocation, scope, meaning, and style. Omission is triggered by co-occurrence with another discourse marker, particle, or word, sharing, partially sharing the meaning, change from intersentential to intrasentential connection, uh, uh, markers used at the sequential domain, mainly continuity, tend to be uh, omitted more often than others, and uh, avoid stylistic options, mark stylistic options also account for some of the omissions. As for, uh, as for addition, the the factors are the same, but the concretion of the, of the factors is different, of course. So uh, and a discourse marker is often added to reinforce another discourse marker or another particle because there's a change from intra to intersentential connection. Uh, in the case of discourse markers indicating sequential sequence, like continuity, but also contrast, and to minimize the risk of misunderstanding and optimize cohesion. As for generalization, uh, the critical factors are change from intersentential to intrasentential. Contrast, in this case, 
the generalization is more frequent with contrast than with any other meaning. Differences in frequency in the use of the discourse markers in both languages. Finally, as for specification, uh, uh, discourse markers uh, can be specified because there's a change from intra to intersentential connection. Uh, the meaning of the specified discourse markers uh, is usually sequential. And when a discourse marker is translated by a non-connective lexical unit, it is generally because there is not a direct counterpart of the discourse marker. So these are my results. And we go to the conclusions. So both explicitation and implicitation of discourse markers are significant in translation. And they are linked to a variety of factors. Not, we don't have one or two factors accounting for this fact, but many factors and different in nature that are syntactic, pragmatic, and even linked to the translation process. Okay? Scope, collocation, and style have an effect on the implicitation and explicitation of discourse markers in translation. Discourse markers are more frequently omitted or added when they act at the sequential meaning, and then the meaning is not propositional or ideational, it's more loose, it's more procedural. Uh, and contrary to expectations, some discourse markers with a specific meaning, mainly, however, are often added. And, and this comes as a surprise because the literature does not uh, say that or, or imagine that this could be. In this case, in my corpus, this is the case. And there are cross-linguistic differences that can be identified as for the use of discourse markers. For instance, the use of however uh, is different from what is supposed to be its other counterparts, dictionary-like counterparts. So now we go back to, we go to my hypothesis. I, I didn't tell you before like the hypothesis just to go into, into the topic and not delay the, the explanation of the study, but I had three hypotheses. And we now check whether these hypotheses have been uh, confirmed or not. So my first hypothesis was, and the specified discourse markers such as and, well, now, are more frequently omitted or added in translation than discourse markers with a more specific meaning, such as however. This is confirmed for omission, but not for generalization or addition of an intersentential discourse marker. So we see that however is also generalized uh, or added. And, and this means that in my case, is not the under specification only of the discourse marker that accounts for these changes, but the general character of the discourse marker, even indicating contrast. Hypothesis two, discourse markers are more frequently omitted, omitted or added when they, are, they act at the structural sequential domain and also interpersonal we, I didn't have interpersonal domain markers, so this is out of the, of the picture in this case. And this is confirmed, omission and addition are linked to a more abstract use as a structural linking uh, device. But there are other important factors because the literature has focused on the domain as the main factor. As we have seen in our corpus, it's, not, it's, it's an important factor, but not the only factor. And, and this is a, a, an interesting result. Hmm? And also uh, the fact of minimizing the risk of misunderstanding search for naturalness can be more powerful factors than the meaning of the discourse marker. Finally, hypothesis three, discourse markers show different frequencies, pragmatic relations and contexts of use in different languages. This has been confirmed and the clearest case is uh, pero the counterpart of Perot as an intersentential discourse marker in, in Catalan is not but. Perot, if you look in the, in the dictionary, you will see that Perot, but. In this case, we have seen that its counterpart at intersentential level is not but, but however. However, translate 12 different Catalan discourse markers and in Catalan, 23 different discourse markers express contrast, whereas only 15 different discourse markers are used to translate contrast in English. 
and this can be linked to some observations made uh, in other papers uh, telling that Catalan and Romance languages maybe uh, use uh, uh, a broader variety of synonyms of elements than English. And this, this can be an interesting characteristic of discourse building. So, some final general questions. So now we go to the beginning and think about translating discourse markers after what we've seen in this restricted case study, but I think that's interesting. And now we can challenge some of the assumptions, general or sometimes kind of naive assumptions, I don't know how to tell that, about the translation of discourse markers. So, the omission or addition of the discourse markers is not always due to the lack of content or low information content or high polyfunctionality. These are quotes from the literature uh, of a discourse markers. The semantics and pragmatics of a discourse markers is one factor, but not the only factor, at least considering the contextual variables of the, of the corpus. So maybe some of the generalization, the explicitation hypothesis, the idea that discourse markers can be easily omitted or added uh, must be restricted to genres, pairs of languages. So it, it, this is a, there, there's a lot of over generalization when we talk about the translation of discourse markers. Another thing that we can challenge is that implicitation and explicitation of a discourse markers are, uh, of a discourse marker are not dangerous to be avoided. Sometimes you see that no, no, you have to translate every single word. No, uh, implicitation and explicitation can add to naturalness and can improve the the target text. So it's it's normal and sometimes it's good and many times it's optional. It's not that you have, but it's just natural. It comes to you, you don't think, when you translate, you don't think, oh, this is a discourse marker, I have to translate it. You just translate. And you are not translating the discourse marker, you are translating the chunk of discourse. And maybe you, you, you didn't even notice that there was a discourse marker there. And that's why you can add it or delete it or change it. And considering only the Catalan English direction, the difference between omission plus generalization and addition plus specification does not support the idea that translation explicitate more than they implicitate. This doesn't mean that this is false, but is that we always have to restrict our generalizations to our corpus, to the situation, to the variables. So we cannot say that in general, translators explicitate more than they explicitate. At least in the case of in the case of intersentential discourse markers, this is not necessarily the case. So there's a need of more fine grain analysis. Of course, I should have made the opposite. I, I, I will do it in the future, have many things to do. <laughs> and this is something that I, I would like to do, just to see the other way around. So translate it from English into Catalan. But uh, I think that, that this review of these general factors and also no, not only one marker or two or three markers, but all the markers and checking that we don't miss any omitted or added marker, uh, I think that this is interesting and it's important to have this global vision of the, of the picture. And I think that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. you have questions, comments? Well, thanks a lot, uh, Maria Jeff, for this, very, for this very nice talk. We have uh, time for two or three questions from the audience, question, comments. So if you want, I, I can start uh, while I give the time that uh, some people think about uh, some questions. Uh, I was, uh, I was wondering uh, the, the contrast that you find between explicitation and implicitation in this uh, specific corpus. How, how do you think it will change in other type of corpora like uh, literary corpus or conversational corpora that use more 
uh, other types of discourse markers and more uh, uh, epistemic like discourse markers, for example. Yeah, I was just wondering this. Yeah, know. yes, of course, of course, in the case of of conversational, as I as I did in 2008, I analyzed the translation of a picture. So it was conversation and very, uh, it was for weddings and a funeral, so it was very interactive. And uh, in this case, of course, th there's more, at least there's more omission, mm -hmm. uh, especially well and some elements. So um, my point is that gender is very important. So you cannot generalize and say, all, uh, the uh, translators always omit, uh, always add, it's not always. So it depends heavily on genre and also on the, on the languages implied and maybe also on the translator, uh, who knows. But uh, what, um, what I have analyzed, I, the translations are, are very good, it, are better than the originals, I have to say, <laughs> which is sometimes the case. It's, it's very frequent that translators improve the originals. Uh, so yes. Uh, if we have more interactive markers, of course, interactive markers uh, can be deleted or added more frequently than these markers which are propositional or structural. And we have seen that structural markers, at, uh, the markers at sequential uh, domains can change uh, more easily than uh, additional markers. So yes, gender is key to, to analyze this process. But the process in itself and the factors, I think that they are they are general, that you can you can see. And what interests me is that you have in the in the in the literature you find people just trying to identify one factor or two factors, and this is multifactorial, and uh, and this is important. So my point is not the results of my research but the process of challenging pre-existing ideas or no results because the results of the others are okay, but you have to frame them. You cannot generalize from those results. So I am not saying that my results are general for others. No, it's just the contrary. I say my results show that other results are not so general and many factors many more factors should be taken into account to describe the, the process of translating a discourse marker. Okay. Okay. That's a question, so uh, well, uh, Janet first, and then we have Martina. Gracias, Maria Jose. Mm -hmm. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Good. Great talk. I have two comments. One, I think in formal written English. I'm not doing this, I'm not doing this. Just put it in the mic. Great talk. I had two comments. One, in formal written English, there is a lot of pressure in uh, English speaking countries to, in stylistics classes in college, to not begin sentences with and and especially the type and that you exemplified. And so I'm not surprised that the data for and are quite different from data that you would get with other connectives, yes. assuming that and is a connective, because and and however, however is a word which I'm sure you're very well aware of, however is probably the, one of the five words in the English language that has had more print in usage manuals about it than practically any other word. Many of the sentences, or many of the examples you had, I would have edited uh, because they began with however, and especially people uh, possibly educated at a different time were taught specifically not to begin contrastive sentences with however, there always has to be an element before so one of the things I think you, in your very interesting study, you can take into account are some of these uh, prescriptive attitudes. And prescriptivism is very common in translation. 
because translators tend to take a conservative approach because they want to reflect what the author said, not what they want to say. So it's just an, an idea. And the second comment I had is one of the factors that you did not consider, but I do think for use of however as a, an equivalent for parole would be fundamental is the use of punctuation. However, in modern, Eng modern English, modern over the past 30 years, is often used uh, right after a semicolon. Semicolons in English were not unheard of 100 years ago, but they were much less common than they are today. It is also the case in English, and you can all look at this through engrams, um, or work, there are a lot of people working on this in English, the use of specific lexical items for connectives, such as moreover, nevertheless, and however, in native writing is going down. The use of semicolon is going up. So there may be a change in, in English discourse structure to use external elements, not only lexical elements, to indicate the connections between the ideas that I think in Romance languages are still fundamentally represented by lexical items. But I do think you need to, because in several of your examples, you had a semicolon right before the however, whereas in the original cat, use, of se use of punctuation is very language specific. But uh, I think that's a factor that does need to be taken into consideration when you're talking about these words. Thank you. Thank you very much. You are right. Uh, um, I, I, am, I am analyzing what's there. So is uh, of course, maybe I should have talked to the translator. I would need to replicate this with different translators. So there are many things to do. But what, what I am analyzing is what's there. And of course, style, it's very important. What, what I was saying at the end, and also Becher, uh, like naturalness and the style uh, features of the language which are derived from prescriptions uh, directly are very, of course, are very important and are, are part of it. Yes, you are right. I will have a look on, on that. Thank you. Question? Okay, thank you. Very interesting. Uh, this is perhaps a naive question. I'm a naive theoretical linguist. And um, some of the, the, the things you said about the translator reminded me of, in my work, I, I use native speaker judgments for, for you know, getting data. And it, it seemed to me that the translator has to use their judgments to figure out how to translate it. That, that, uh, so my question is, from your research, what would be the, is there a practical, uh, you know, like advice that one would give to a translator when it comes to discourse market, as opposed to like the ideation, like the propositional uh, work that they ha can use some kind of strategy or, or is intuition still the best thing to do? Very, very, it's not a naive question. It's a very important question. And I don't know if I can <laughs> answer properly, but I don't think, well, I, I, I have my ideas as an analyst, but uh, I, I'm also a translator. So, and in the last book I translated, I have annotated my decisions, but uh, they are there. So I want to annotate, like, annotate myself, see what, what I've done. And as a translator, what I can, even, and, and, and I am very conscious of discourse markers, uh, but it's, it's something that you don't think. It's not. And especially because discourse marker is like a relatively new concept and, and it's not well defined. So it's not like, and in general, the translation techniques are, um, are meant to account for the translation of lexical items. If you read the, the list of translation techniques and the, and the examples, they are thought to, to see how to cope with lexical items, not with this procedural elements and I don't think it's something that is conscious you, you don't stop to think how to translate uh, however or tamate you, you don't think you just translate and you are not translated you are not translating however you are translating the whole chunk so it's not something conscious maybe if a 
universities, they are telling, I don't know, uh, people are telling something about translating discourse markers. The, this can have an effect, but I don't think so. I think, I think it's very, like, very natural. So you, you, just tra you just translate, and then you read, and if it's okay, if it sounds okay, it's okay. And you, you, you don't remember anymore if there was there a discus marker or not, or another discus marker. It's just, it flows. Translation must flow. So I think it's intuitive. So unless there is a, an urgent question, which I don't think uh, there is, uh, let's uh, thank the speaker, and uh, we'll have a nice uh, start of the quarter. Thanks a lot. Uh.